Hey, this is Tony from Adafruit, and in this video, I'm going to look at how to use CircuitPython with Mac OS or OS X. And this is basically a walkthrough of how to edit files, how to run code with CircuitPython, but from a Mac. So I'll look at different editors you can use and what are some of the conventions for using CircuitPython with a board like the Circuit Playground Express. Or we'll also look at the Gemma M0, so a couple of nice little boards from Adafruit that run CircuitPython. And we'll look at specifically for Mac OS or OS X. Uh, basically, this is a follow-up video. I've done a video on how to use CircuitPython with Chrome OS and with Windows 10. So I'll put links in the, in the description below when this goes up on YouTube. Take a look below and you can see that uh, where I go through the same thing, I look at what are the different text editors, what are the serial terminals that you might use on those platforms. So for this one, I figured let's look at Mac OS X and see what are some good options here. I keep calling it OS X, although it's technically now called Mac OS. Uh, and for reference, I'm using OS X uh, El Capitan, which is the version right before Mac OS. But what I'm going to say is basically should apply to all versions of Mac OS X or Mac OS, the latest versions. So let's just dive in. Uh, we'll get started here. We'll go to the main view and see what we've got. Let's see. We'll go there. And in the upper right hand corner, we'll look at uh, these two boards right here. Like I mentioned, the Circuit Playground Express is the bigger board, and then the small one is the Gemma M0. Uh, and then this is uh, obviously my Mac desktop right here. So this is, uh, let's see, what version, what do I have uh, on this Mac? Let's see, this is El Capitan. So 10.11.6 is what I'm using. Um, I think Mac OS is technically the next version, so I haven't upgraded yet to that, but maybe I should in the future. Uh, as far as I know, everything still works the same on Mac OS X uh, or Mac OS. Uh, so everything that I say should hopefully work, but let me know in the comments if something doesn't work. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to start with was uh, the Circuit Playground Express board. So we'll look at how to load the Circuit Python firmware onto this board because with this board right now, when you get it, it's uh, just running a basic Arduino test sketch. So you need to load the firmware onto the board. I'll show you how to do that. It's really easy. It shows up as a little USB file uh, or USB drive, and you can just drag files onto it to reprogram it. So I'll show you how to load that firmware. Uh, and then I'll also show how to connect to the serial terminal on this board so you can edit Python code or basically run Python code. And then I'll show you how to edit files on this so that you can have like your main Python code that's running and controlling the peripherals on Circuit Playground Express. And then we'll also look at how to do that with Gemma M0. It's the same thing. There are a few little tricks with Gemma M0 that I wanted to mention uh, because there is a little bit of a difference. So the Gemma M0 and the Circuit Playground Express board, these both have the same processor. It's the SAMD21 uh, processor, but a little bit different in their capabilities. So the Circuit Playground Express has things like NeoPixels built in. There's an accelerometer. There's some buttons and things. The Gemma M0 is a lot smaller, uh, made for little wearable projects, doesn't have as many inputs and outputs around the outside. Um, there is a little NeoPixel built into it, or I, I believe it's a dot star LED, uh, but a little RGB LED built into it, uh, but you don't have like a ring of 10 of them like on this board. But the one big difference is on Circuit Playground Express, there is a little two megabyte flash memory chip that lets you store more files and Python code. Whereas on the Gemma M0, you don't have that extra flash space. So you have a smaller file system, which means you can't store as many files. And how you copy files onto here, particularly with Mac OS, uh, changes a little bit uh, when you're using that Gemma M0 because you actually want to be careful about creating all these temporary and random files and uh, maybe prevent that so you get more storage space. So anyways, we'll dive in and I'll, like I said, we'll start with the Circuit Playground Express and kind of go through a workflow of how to load the firmware connect to the serial terminal, and then how to edit code on the board. So let's get started. And by the way, I'll put links in the description below when this is on YouTube so you can find links to all the products and all the web pages I mentioned here. Uh, Circuit Playground Express, obviously you're gonna need one of these boards. Um, and then, like I mentioned, this board, it doesn't right now, it's uh, the developer edition, so it's kind of an initial edition, doesn't ship with CircuitPython uh, firmware yet. So when you get it, you need to load CircuitPython firmware onto it. Um, it's also just good to know how to load this firmware because, for example, when the firmware gets updated, you'll need to load the latest version of the firmware um, onto here. And again, this is a big difference with Arduino. In Arduino, you open the Arduino editor, you upload your code, and you never really have to worry about what firmware version of the Arduino IDE you're using or like you know what li Arduino library version you have. Uh, because every time you compile and upload from the Arduino IDE, it's automatically adding everything that Arduino needs into your code, and then that code is running on the chip. Whereas with CircuitPython and MicroPython, you've got to load the Python environment or the Python interpreter onto your board first, 
and that has you know a different version that might be maybe like an older version a newer version or whatever but then once that's on your board then you can load your python code which is separate from all of the micro uh, the, the python interpreter that runs on the board so let's get started then with this uh, like I said, with Circuit Playground, it's pretty easy, uh, and especially on Mac, you don't have to worry about any driver installation. So just out of the box, if you plug this in, this is a USB connection that's connected to my computer. Uh, when you plug this in, it's ready to go for Mac OS X, so you shouldn't have to worry about having to install uh, things like drivers to access the board. I actually have CircuitPython running already on this board, but it doesn't really matter. Even if you don't have it running, uh, the steps are going to be the same here. Now to load the latest version of CircuitPython, for the Circuit Playground Express board, you'll need to download the firmware. Uh, and to do that, you'll want to go to this page. This is the Circuit Python GitHub repository. I'll put a link in the description below. Uh, and on this page, this is the home of Circuit Python and all of the code. You can find links to all the documentation and stuff uh, off of here. But what you want to check out is the releases tab right here. So you click under releases and you'll find the latest release. And then for the board that you're using, you'll want to download the firmware file for it. And so, for example, for Circuit Playground Express, I want to download this file right here, the Circuit Playground, Circuit Playground Express, or Circuit Python, Circuit Playground Express 1.0.0.uf2 file. Uh, you do want to be careful. So there are multiple versions of firmware for different boards. Some boards have a .bin file, like the Arduino Zero right here and some boards have a .uf2 file, like with Circuit Playground Express. And so that just changes how you load the firmware onto the board. For things that have a .bin firmware, you need to use a tool called BASA, BASA C. That's uh, what Arduino actually uses internally to load the firmware onto your board. And I've actually mentioned, I'll put a link to the SAMD21 MicroPython guide. Uh, we kind of explain how to use the BASA tool, BASA C tool, to upload the firmware. That's kind of the old way of loading firmware onto the SAMD21 chips. Um, for all of the Adafruit boards, at least, that are using a bootloader that we have, um, they support this .uf2 firmware mode, which I've shown a bunch of times. But this is kind of nice because it means flashing the firmware is actually just a file copy. So the bootloader turns into a USB drive when it's connected to your computer, and you can just drag this .uf2 file onto your board's file system, and it will reprogram it uh, and get the latest firmware on there. So you definitely want to prefer the UF2 versions if you see like a .bin or a .uf2 version of your board. But uh, download this file, which I've done ahead of time. So let me go grab that. Uh, so you'll see, for example, here's the UF2 file. And right now this board is connected to my computer. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press the reset button twice. Uh, if it's running an Arduino sketch, I noticed uh, you might just need to press it once. But basically, um, or if it's running a CircuitPython sketch, sometimes you need to press it twice. Uh, it just kind of depends on what was running on your board before. But either try pressing reset once or try pressing it twice. And ultimately what you want to see on Circuit Playground Express, oops, I didn't press it fast enough. Let me, uh, there we go. You want to see all of the lights light up green like this because this means that the board is in its firmware bootloader mode. So it's waiting for you to copy that UF2 file onto it. And if you look in the finder, the little explorer here in Mac OS X, on the left-hand side, you can actually see there's this CPlay boot drive. That's the name of this drive. And that's actually telling me that there is a drive connected to my Mac right now called CPlay boot, and that's the Circuit Playground Express bootloader drive. And you'll see there's actually some files that are inside of here. This has the current firmware as a .uf2 file, which is kind of interesting and kind of neat that it shows that. But you don't really need to mess with anything on here. Uh, now to load CircuitPython onto here, all you need to do is grab this .uf2 file that I downloaded and make sure to use the Circuit Playground Express firmware. Uh, for example, if I load the Gemma M0, it's going to load it, but it's probably not going to boot up. It's probably not going to run correctly after this. Uh, but to get out of that, just double press the reset, get back into this green light mode. Uh, the bootloader should be able to reload the proper firmware if you accidentally load the wrong one. But I'm just going to drag this onto the board and it just reloaded it basically. So it happened real quickly. You might have seen the red light flashed uh, in the upper right hand corner as it rewrote the firmware and then it just reloaded. Uh, and you might actually see that now the drive is actually called CircuitPy, so it's not called CPlay Boot anymore. And that's because with CircuitPython, uh, on the M0 boards, we expose all of the files as a USB drive, so you can edit your Python code directly on here. Now, one little note, um, sometimes you might notice on Mac 
when you drag a firmware onto the CPlay boot drive, you get an out of space error. Uh, and this happens with older versions of the bootloader. Uh, this bug I think was fixed in the latest ones. So you probably won't see this with boards that are shipping today, but just in case you see an out of space issue, rename the file from something that's really long like this to a shorter file name, like just call it like current.uf2 and then drag that onto your CPlay boot drive and try again. Uh, the issue is an older version of the bootloader didn't support the longer file name sometimes, at least from Mac, it got it in some weird state. So this is kind of a, a little workaround to, uh, to make that work uh, for this. So that's all you need to do though. So at this point, the board is now running CircuitPython firmware and let's connect to the serial terminal, the serial REPL, which is where you execute Python code. Uh, so I'm gonna do that real quick. And what I'll do is I'll use a terminal program to do that. So you open the terminal in Mac OS X, uh, and we're gonna use a tool that actually ships, it's built into the Mac operating system. It's called Screen. And it's uh, an old tool that was used for uh, connecting to uh, serial ports, basically, or some of these, uh, these COM ports on your computer. Now, first, you need to know what's the name of the, the REPL serial port on your Mac. And so one way to do that, you can actually list with the ls command. Uh, you can list with the dash l option, which says just list something from a directory, like list all of the subdirectories. And we want to list everything under slash dev slash tty dot star. So this is just going to list all of the devices that are called tty dot something. So this will list all the serial devices because on Mac, they call all of the serial devices uh, slash dev slash tty dot and then it's usually dependent on the type of device. So I'll do that and we actually see uh, a few things here. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Wow, I haven't noticed this uh, USB modem 12 device. I haven't seen that thing before. I don't know what that is. Uh, but this is showing me that there are three serial devices connected to my computer right now. Uh, there's this Bluetooth incoming port. Usually you wanna ignore this. Um, if you have Bluetooth, like if it's uh, a Mac uh, laptop or even like your desktop probably have it, uh, they have a Bluetooth serial port that's just always there. Uh, but then you're typically looking for something like this, USB modem like 1411, for example, that should be the serial REPL for this board. And if you're not really sure, what you can do is unplug the board, run the command. So, uh, oh, interesting, wow, so it's still there. So I must have something connected to my Mac that's showing up as a serial port. I'm looking at all the things connected and I don't see anything, so that, that's weird. Well, anyway, so now I know when I connect this board, it looks like it should be that USB modem 12 device. So I do that and so, oh, now it's USB modem 13. So that's the new device that I just connected and that's the serial port that I wanna use for that. Now to open that serial port with the screen command, you wanna run screen and then give the name of the serial port that you wanna open. So this uh, tty.usb modem 13. So say dev uh, tty, oops, wait, tty.usb modem 13. And then you have to specify the baud rate or the speed of the serial terminal connection. And for CircuitPython, it's always 115200, 115200 baud uh, for that. So we open that up and it will immediately jump into the serial REPL. And since I've just connected this board and I haven't really done anything on it, it's telling me that it's in this auto run mode. Uh, but if I wanna get out of this, basically I can just press enter and that's gonna give me the serial REPL prompt. Um, if your board was running some code, like you had a main.py, you could press control C and that would uh, basically kick out of whatever program you were running. But this is the Python prompt. Uh, so I can say, hey, hello world, and we're all good here. So we've got all of the, uh, the Python goodness at our fingertips here. So the screen command's really nice. Um, I like it because it's simple and it's already installed. Like I said, you don't have to install anything. This is built into your Mac, um, at least as of right now. Who knows in the future if Apple maybe gets rid of this. Uh, but this is simple and easy and it works pretty well. Uh, and I would recommend using this, you know, just to get access to the serial terminal. Uh, so I'm gonna close out of that. And then like I mentioned, to list the serial ports, use this ls-l slash dev slash tty dot star command, and that will list all of the serial devices connected to your computer. Um, okay, so now the next thing is, I've got my board, it's running CircuitPython, I know how to access the serial REPL, now how do I edit code on this board? And on Mac, you have a lot of options. Um, you really just need to use any text editor. So Mac actually has built into it uh, a text editor. So if I go to uh, the finder and you can see here's the drive, uh, there's that CircuitPy drive, like I mentioned, this is 
my board showing up as a USB drive. And so if I put Python code in here, then it will be on my board right here. And if I name it like main.py, then the board will automatically run that file. Uh, so I could create a main.py with like the text editor that's built into Mac OS X, um, but I wouldn't recommend using the Mac OS X built-in text editor uh, because it actually tries to create like backup copies and old, it will keep versions of text files and Python source files and things. It's gonna try to store those. And depending on your board, that might be stored as like a hidden file that takes up a lot of space. And you might like really quickly run out of space because the Mac, it's not smart enough to realize that this board only has a few megabytes of storage space. So maybe it shouldn't turn on, you know, some of these advanced features that use up a lot of space. Uh, so I would actually recommend using a programmer's text editor. And you have a lot of options on Mac. Um, you can use a lot of the old standbys that people swear by, like v Vim, VI, uh, Emacs. You could definitely use one of those. Uh, but I'm going to show one that I like to use that's cross-platform, free, open source, called Atom. Um, so it's the Atom text editor made by uh, some folks at GitHub. And it's really nice. It's, uh, it's real simple to install. It actually works on Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux. So you can use it across a bunch of different platforms. Um, and like I said, it's free and open source and it works well. So go to this atom.io webpage and I'll put a link in the description when this is on YouTube and download it for your Mac, obviously. Um, download the latest version, install it, and you can open it up and it looks like this uh, when you boot it up. So it's a nice kind of simple editor. And what you can actually do is you can open a folder in the Atom editor. So if I go to open and if I just select this uh, circuit Python drive right here. I can just click open and this is nice. It will actually show me on the left here a little file tree. So I can just add and edit files directly from inside the text editor right here. I don't even have to go into uh, the finder to start editing these things. So that's kind of handy and a nice thing that I like about the Atom editor. And so if I want, I can just say, let's create a new file um, and let's call this main.py. And so it's creating this main.py. And let's just have it print uh, hello world inside of here. So I'll save that. And what I'm going to do, if I go into file, save, or if I press uh, the Apple S key, that will actually save the file. Uh, when I save this, it's going to rewrite it out to the board. And um, the board will automatically rerun it as long as it's in the auto reload mode. So I'm going to go back and let's open up the serial terminal again from uh, our, our screen session. So let me go back and oops, uh, oh, come on. My terminal seems to have locked up. It's uh, there we go. There's a screen command. Okay. So this is the serial REPL that I just opened. And just to show like there's the REPL. Um, so it's not in the auto reload mode right now, but I'm going to press control D D is in dog. And that's going to reset the board and it's going to put it back in that auto reload mode. And it actually just ran the main.py. So this is kind of nice. It shows, you know, hey, here's your main.py output. Here's hello world. Uh, but just to show the really nice workflow that you get with CircuitPython, if I go back and if I change this file, so this, remember, this is the Atom text editor. It's open on the CircuitPy drive. It's showing all the files. Here's the main.py file. If I change this, hello world uh, again. And then what I'm going to do, maybe I'll drag this over so you can kind of see this happen. So I'm going to press the Apple S key to save this file. And then I do that. And notice on the left here in the serial terminal, it saw that the file changed and it just re-ran it. So it just ran it. And you see, here's the output, hello world again inside of there. So this is kind of the main workflow for CircuitPython where you have your board connected, you have your file editor open, You've got your main.py with the code that you want to run. Um, you might have other files on here, other Python source files that you can import from your main.py. Um, you edit your files, you save them, and then you see the results. Like you could see, for example, if you're like lighting up the NeoPixels and things on this board, you might just visually see it happening on your board. Or you could have the serial terminal open and you can see the output of uh, the terminal and what's happening. And then if you need with the serial terminal, you can actually uh, like press enter to leave the uh, the the auto reload mode and actually get to the Python prompt if you want to like debug or maybe just explore and experiment with things. Um, so lots of cool options. And again, I really like the Atom text editor because it's real simple and uh, nice and easy to install. It uh, looks nice. It's easy to uh, configure. So that works really well. Now there's one little cool thing I just wanted to show um, because it is kind of annoying sometimes um, 
to have the serial terminal open separately from the Atom Editor. You know, it would be nice if you could actually have like a little pane inside of the Atom Editor that shows the serial terminal because then at that point it would be basically a little uh, IDE, a little integrated development environment where you've got your file view on the left right here, you've got your code open here, and you can have multiple files open. Like this boot output is actually showing uh, the output of the boot up of the circuit Python board. So if it was like configuring hardware in special ways, whatever, maybe I could see output, but you know, I can have multiple files open here with different tabs, but the missing piece would be, wouldn't it be nice to have like a little pane down here with the serial terminal open? Uh, it turns out you can get that though. So I'll show you that in a second. What first I want to close out of the screen session right here. Uh, so the cool thing about the Atom text editor is it has a lot of plugins that you can add to it that extend its functionality. Uh, and so if you go into the preferences and you go down to install right here, you can actually search for all of these custom packages, third-party packages that people have created. And it turns out there's some terminal uh, packages that you can install that give you a little terminal pane uh, on the Atom text editor. So if you actually search for terminal and press enter, that will search for all of the terminal packages. And uh, the one that you want to use, so I did some investigation and some digging and there you'll find a lot of these like terminal panel, atom terminal panel, atom terminal. Um, unfortunately, the only one I found that works is this top one right here, at least as of right now, uh, as of, you know, like August uh, 2017, Platform IO IDE terminal. So this package right here is the one that you want to install. This is a fork of an older uh, terminal plus package but I tried Terminal Plus and it just doesn't work for me on this version of Atom. And I tried some of the other terminal uh, packages and it looks like they've kind of been abandoned. So that's sometimes the way things go uh, with open source stuff. But luckily it looks like this platform IO one is kind of the de facto uh, terminal uh, plugin that you want. So click this package and there, there should be an install button. I've already installed it. So it gives me the uninstall option, but click the install and that will install this package uh, on your uh, system and you should be ready to go. And to use this, um, I'll, I'll put a link, this is a link to kind of the home page of this, or at least the GitHub source code for it. Uh, but it installs a few options here after you uh, install it in the Atom text editor. So you can find it under packages and this platform IO IDE terminal. So you can use this to interact with it. You can use this to open a new terminal window, for example, or it also shows you here are the keyboard shortcuts. Uh, and so this one right here is basically if you press control back tick. So the back tick um, is kind of right below your escape button usually. Then that's going to open up. Uh, it'll open the terminal if it's not open or it'll close it if it's already open. So if I press that, then check that out. It just popped open a little terminal down here. And I'm going to press that control back tick again and it just closes it back down. So this is kind of the missing piece. If I go back to my main.py, so I've got a terminal open here, and this is just like my terminal right here from uh, the Mac. So I can run any of the same commands um, inside of here. So for example, I can list all the serial ports inside of here uh, and see, okay, there's my USB modem 13 device. And I can use the screen command from inside of here. So we'll say USB modem 13, oops, 11.5200 baud. And now I'm connected to the terminal. And if I press enter in here, you know, I've got my Python prompt. And so I can say, hello world. And I can see that's the Python code from this board uh, running. But I've also got my main.py up here. So let's say, hello world, uh, third time. How about that? So I'll save that. Uh, and now because I'm not in the auto reload mode down here, it's not going to automatically rerun it. But I'll press control D, D is in dog. That's going to do a soft reset. So I press that and it just reset it and said, hey, there's hello world third time. It shows the output. Now that it's in that auto reload mode, this is where, you know, this is maybe the uh, IDE experience for uh, CircuitPython with the Atom text editor. So I can say, you know, let's edit my code and let's say print, you know, uh, another line is fun too down here. How about print uh, 10 divided by two equals, and then let's do format. 10 divided by two and see what we get there. So I'm just gonna press the Apple S key to save this. And I do that and then cool, notice that I just see my output down here in the terminal. So it, it caught the main.py change, it reran the file, and then here's the output there. So I'm seeing the output of uh, that command here. So this is pretty cool and this is a really easy workflow 
than I would recommend for the Mac OS uh, platform. And this would also work on Windows, um, but you won't have the screen command as an option, unfortunately, to use. But if you go back to the Windows uh, video that I did, I actually showed uh, that there is a Python serial terminal package that you can install that gives you a serial terminal command line command that's similar to the screen command uh, that you can also use on Windows. And so that could be an option for that. Uh, but this is really nice in that you've got your files here, you've got your code here, and then you've got your serial output. And so that's really everything you need to start editing and uh, dealing with uh, Python code on um, the Mac operating system. Um, okay, so there's one other thing that I wanted to show then was how to use the Gemma M0, so this small version of a CircuitPython board. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, let's see, let's close out of this file. I'm just going to close all the open files right now. In fact, I'm just going to close the whole text editor because I just want to make sure that everything is closed. I don't have the serial terminal open. Uh, and then I'm just going to disconnect my CircuitPython, my Circuit Playground Express board. And let's connect my Gemma M0 board like that. And I'll put a link. This is the Gemma M0 product page. And then uh, you definitely want to check out the Gemma M0 guide. So this has good explanations about how to load CircuitPython firmware, um, a little bit of explanation about uh, how to use it with Arduino. You can also program this from the Arduino IDE. Uh, talks about you know everything that I've kind of mentioned before um, inside of here. But the really important and cool thing with the Gem M0 is it's actually shipping with CircuitPython right now. Um, so I just connected it, and it's it's running CircuitPython. It's ready to go. So I can go back to my terminal. Um, and let's see. Let me just increase the size again on this. And I can list uh, you know the serial devices again, uh, tty.star. And so I see a USB modem 14. I can connect to that, dev tty.usb modem 14, 11.5, 200 baud. And this is actually showing, it's, it's kind of neat. By default, it's outputting uh, the analog voltage. So it's just uh, kind of raising and lowering the A0 uh, or A1 output. So I could connect like an LED to that and I'd see it like brighten and dim, for example. Um, but this is kind of cool. So that's showing the, the script that's running. Uh, I can actually look at that source code if I want. So maybe if I close out of this and let's open the Atom text editor again. And then let's go to, uh, well, this is kind of nice. It remembered the last thing I had open was the CircuitPy drive. And because this is running the CircuitPython firmware, it's going to show up as a CircuitPy drive again. Um, so if I want, I can just double click the main.py. And this is the code that's running uh, on, this on this Gemma M0 just out of the box like this. And this is cool. This is the Python code. And you can actually see it's lighting the little dot star uh, pixel that's on here. It's kind of cycling through some rainbow colors. So you can see exactly how it does that. It's uh, just going through and using, uh, it ported over kind of the rainbow cycle, this wheel function that we have uh, from the Arduino version of this sketch. Um, so that's kind of cool. And uh, you can also see there's more stuff on this board. And it may, might be easier if I use the, the finder to kind of show this. So if I go to the CircuitPy drive right here, you can see there's stuff like there's a lib folder inside of here. And this has some Python files. Um, you know, there's uh, a Windows 7 driver. So this is kind of nice. On, on Windows, you need a driver to access this. On Mac, you don't. Um, but we actually just ship the driver inside of here. So you can install this directly if you need to. Uh, so this is kind of cool. And it just shows some of the stuff that we have out of the box. Now, like I mentioned, though, the big difference between the Gemma M0 and the Circuit Playground Express board, other than like the physical size, one is a lot smaller than the other. But the one big difference is that the Gemma M0 does not have this two megabyte flash chip on it. So all of your Python files, all of the files you see right here on the CircuitPy drive have to fit within the 64 kilobytes of the Python file system, uh, file system that CircuitPython creates on the SAMD21 microprocessors. The SAMD21 has, uh, if I remember correctly, I think 256 kilobytes of flash memory. So we take 64 kilobytes of that and give it to you as the file system that you see right here. Um, so just be aware that all of your Python code, all of the libraries that you use with the Gemma M0 have to fit within that 64K file system. Whereas on the, uh, the Circuit Playground M0 and any of the Express boards, like the Metro M0 Express, the Feather M0 Express, uh, the Express boards are the ones that have that two megabyte flash chip. And so that two megabyte flash is where you store your Python code. So it's a lot bigger than the 64 kilobytes. So you can store more code, you can store uh, files and, and things like that. 
Uh, so just be aware that you have less file storage on the Gemma M0 board, but the workflow is exactly the same as far as how you edit this. So like this is the main.py, um, you know, how about maybe I want to comment out printing out all of that uh, analog output stuff. So uh, this is basically, it's like looking for a capacitive touch and it's telling me if it's touched. Um, you know, let's comment out this line, maybe right here where it's reading the analog voltage on A1 and printing it out. Let's comment that out. So I'll do that. I'll save this. Uh, maybe before I save it, let's open up the serial terminal again. So I'm going to press that control back tick. Uh, and I'm going to use that terminal that I installed a second ago. And then let's open the screen command again against uh, the device. So you can see there's all my A1. So it looks like it's actually showing the output of the analog uh, to digital converter. But what I'm going to do is, like I said, I just commented out this print A0 line right here. I'll save it. And it just reloaded. And so this is cool. So now it's running. You can see the LED is still changing colors. But now it's not printing out that A1 uh, analog input stuff. And it, it should still print out, I guess, if I touch A2. So if I touch this, yeah, that's cool. So it's, it's doing the capacitive touch. And so you can see right here, uh, when I when touch 2 dot value is true, then uh, it's printing out A2 is touched. And so I see that in the terminal down here. Uh, so really cool. And this is you know really neat. Just this Gemma out of the box, it's ready to go running CircuitPython. You've got an example here. You can start modifying it. Um, you know, I, I didn't really install anything other than the Atom text editor and uh, this little terminal plugin here to, uh, to access it. So that's really cool. Um, now, you might need to know, though, like let's say a newer version of CircuitPython is available for the Gemma M0, um, or maybe you loaded an Arduino sketch on the Gemma M0 and you want to now load CircuitPython again. Because if you go from CircuitPython back to Arduino, that erases the CircuitPython firmware. So you lose all of that firmware. Uh, you can run an Arduino sketch. But if you want to go back to CircuitPython, you have to reload the CircuitPython firmware. And the process, it's exactly the same as what I showed for Circuit Playground Express. Uh, we actually mention it in the guide right here. So it mentions how to load CircuitPython onto this board. And it's the same process. You want to go to the rele releases tab of the CircuitPython repository, grab the latest release, but this time you want to get the Gemma M0.uf2 file like this. Uh, and then just double tap the reset button. And on this board, it's right there. And notice the pixel turns green uh, like that. And I should also see that I have, uh, there's now a Gemma boot. So Gemma boot drive like that. And then uh, what I want to do is grab my UF2 file. So if I grab this Gemma M0 UF2, I'll drag it over there. You see the red light just flashed, and it just finished. It just loaded the CircuitPython firmware on the board. Um, I know it's funny. I just uh, my, my screen command was still open, and so it looks like it, it closed it uh, because it basically disconnected the board as it did that flashing. Uh, but I should have a serial terminal, uh, or I should have this showing up as a serial device again. And actually, I'm going to close this terminal and reopen it um, because I've noticed the, the screen command sometimes when you accidentally, uh, if you have the screen command open and if you like disconnect your board or if you turn off, if you like abruptly stop the serial connection, the screen command doesn't recover very well from that. It, it will mess up your terminal. Like notice my terminal here is like, you know, it's, it's showing my prompt on the same line. Um, so what I want to do is I want to reload this uh, terminal session and actually, I don't remember how to do that in uh, this platform IO terminal thing. So let's say, let's close this terminal and then let's go back and let's reopen a new one. I think this should hopefully create a new terminal for me. So there we go. I think this is fine. Yeah, it looks like we're back in business. Uh, so now let's just list the serial devices again to just make sure that I see, or oops, TTY star. So yeah, it looks like it's probably this uh, USB modem 16 device. And if I connect to that tty.usb modem 16, 11.5200 bond, then I should be hopefully at the uh, Python prompt. And yeah, I am. So if I press Control C, because remember this main.py is running right now, so it's in a main loop. Um, so I have to interrupt that loop by pressing Control C. So I do that, and then it stops running, and I've got my Python prompt, and I'm ready to go uh, with this board. So that's pretty cool, uh, and you know, just something to be aware of uh, on how to load the firmware for this. You know, again, you just drag, uh, you double press the reset, get it into the bootloader mode. You'll see the Gemma boot drive. 
drag your firmware over and you're good to go. And if you get an out of space error for some reason when you drag the UF2, rename it to a small file name like current.uf2 and then drag that over to the board. Um, and that should work for that. So that's uh, how you load the firmware. Now the one little gotcha that I wanted to mention for the Gemma M0, um, because it doesn't have that larger flash chip, and so its drive is a lot smaller than um, your, uh, your, the drive that you would get on your Circuit Playground Express board, you might run into space issues. Like if you get a really complex uh, Python, I guess, not necessarily sketch program, I guess now I should call it, I'm still using Arduino terminology, but a really complex program, you might get to a point where it takes up so much space that you can't store it on your drive anymore. And you can free up some space on this uh, Gemma uh, board. So I could delete this Windows 7 driver because I don't need this on Mac. So we'll say move that to trash. Uh, the README, I can probably delete this. Although this is kind of handy. I mean, you can open this up in the Atom editor right here. This just shows um, you know, some little tips on how to get started with it. But I could delete that if I needed to. And, and you could actually delete this from within the Atom editor. You can just right click. Oops, I don't want to do main.py. Let's do that. And then we'll say delete. Um, and yep, just wants to double check, move that to trash. So I can free up a few files like that. But there's one little gotcha. Um, with the Mac, it likes to create a lot of hidden files. So let's say I had on my computer, you know, a main.py, and I drag it onto the CircuitPython drive to copy it over. Now, in a lot of cases, it's just going to copy that main.py, and that's all you get. But in some cases, the Mac operating system stores extra metadata with files because in Mac you can actually go to a file um, let's see I don't know if it's going to show me for this file but let's see if I look at this file this main.py you know in some cases you can actually get like old versions like the Mac operating system can st store a version history of files it can store all this metadata it will remember for example if I download a file from the internet like uh, these uh, if I go back to the uh, the UF2 firmwares Actually, I downloaded these from the internet, and so the Mac operating system remembers that. It actually stores a little bit inside of its info. Like, check this out. It, it knows where I downloaded this file from. And even if I copy this file onto another computer, it's gonna remember this, which is kind of weird, a little bit creepy in some ways, but that's that info has to be stored somewhere, and it's not in the UF2 file itself. There's nothing in the file that stores this info. It's actually this extra metadata that Mac OS X stores internally. Um, and I think it tries to be helpful. It tries to warn you if you download an executable file and you try to run it, it will pop up a warning that's like, hey, you downloaded this from the internet. Are you sure you want to do that? Like this could be a virus or something, uh, which, which is helpful. But the problem is that metadata is stored um, in this extra part of the file system on your Mac. And that file system doesn't support those extra hidden files and things on your CircuitPython drive. So if I try to copy a downloaded file uh, from my computer onto my CircuitPython drive on the Mac operating system, it will try to recreate or it's going to create these hidden files that include all of that extra metadata, like where the file was downloaded from, um, you know, all this extra state. It will happily store that in a hidden file that it creates. Um, now, this normally wouldn't be a problem, but those hidden files are really big. It creates these four kilobyte sized hidden files for each file that you copy over onto your drive. So if you just drag and drop uh, a, a folder of Python files that you downloaded from the internet, even if they're less than 64 kilobytes, you'll probably run out of space because Mac behind the scenes for each of those files is creating this little hidden metadata file to store stuff like where it was downloaded from and all that kind of state. Um, so we don't want that, unfortunately. In most cases, we don't want that, or at least especially for the CircuitPython drive, we don't want that for this Gem M0 board um, because we just don't have the space to store that stuff. For the Feather or for the uh, Circuit Playground Express board, it might not be as big of an issue because with two megabytes, you know, okay, a four kilobyte file, not the end of the world. Um, if you start to run into space issues, you could you, you could do the same thing that I'm about to show you on this board also. But I'll show you there are some commands you can run that basically fix um, the issues with these hidden files that are created, and this is all mentioned um, on this page right here that I'll link to from uh, this older SAMD21 MicroPython guide that I did. And basically, it's there's this Mac OS X file copy issue section where I describe this issue where Mac will create these hidden files 
And if your files are downloaded from the internet, um, like a lot of our guides kind of show you to download a source file, uh, you'll run into this problem. Now you can fix this though by running these commands right here. And so these commands basically turn off the spotlight indexing that Mac OS X will do. So Mac will try to index all of the files on a drive so you can search for them but it stores that index on the drive itself, and so that takes up some space. So one of these commands turns that off. Uh, this will delete all of these little hidden files that Mac creates, um, things like thumbnails and Explorer. It's gonna delete those, and it's actually gonna create some of these placeholder files um, that are zero size. They won't take any space up, but they'll prevent Mac OS X from creating these little kind of placeholder files or the, these files that actually take up a lot of space. So there's this FS event D uh, kind of file that's created. It takes a lot of space, but if we create one that's, that has nothing inside of it, then that'll prevent your Mac from creating it and taking up a bunch of space. Um, and then the last thing is I'll show you, there's a special way to copy files that tells your Mac not to include those little hidden metadata files that I was mentioning, those 4K files. So what we want to do is run through this little set of commands in the terminal. And this depends on the volume name. So the volume name is the name of the drive. And that's under the uh, slash volume. So if I do lsl slash volumes with my board connected like this, I'll actually see I have a, a volume here called CircuitPy. Now in this guide, when this was written, uh, it, the volume used to be called MicroPython, but it kind of mentions here, you might need to look and see with this lsl volumes command. Uh, what the name of your drive is. So I see there's a CircuitPy uh, drive. So that just means for the rest of these commands, you know, anything that references volumes MicroPython, I actually want to reference volumes CircuitPy. I want to reference the name of the volume for my board right here. But let's go in and let's just start running these commands. So there's this mdutil off command. This turns off the spotlight indexing. But again, I need to change this to the CircuitPy drive. So I'll do that. Uh, so that disables Spotlight for that volume. And luckily, you just need to do this once, as far as I understand, for uh, each of these drives. So even if you have multiple boards, you just disable this once and you're good. This is just a one-time little thing. Um, and then the next commands, these will go in and delete any of these temporary files that might have been created uh, already. Because as soon as I plug this in and open uh, the Finder and look at this, it already is creating these little hidden thumbnail files and things. So it's, you know, it's trying to be helpful, but uh, you know, this is these days, well, you know, these days hard drive space is basically unlimited. Like we have, you know, it, gigabytes and gigabytes and sometimes terabytes of hard drive space. Um, whereas, you know, way back in the day when we used to have like DOS and things like that, when you only had kilobytes of space, it actually mattered when you created all these little uh, metadata files and things. And, you know, we, we wouldn't do all that stuff automatically. Whereas these days, it's like, yeah, sure, who cares? A few kilobytes doesn't matter. So it's funny that, you know, you, you, you use these tiny little chips and you're kind of back in the old days of computing when, when file space and, and disk size mattered a lot. Anyways, let's run uh, these commands. So I'm going to switch to that volume, that directory, the CircuitPy directory. Uh, now I'm inside here. This is actually just listing. I, I can see all the files. If I wanted, I could edit these files from here. And this is another workflow if you want to use just the terminal itself. Um, but let's see, let's keep going. So this rmrf command is going to delete all of these little spotlight and other kind of hidden files that are created. Uh, so I'm just going to run this one as is. So that goes through and deletes some stuff. Then this goes and this makedir fs event, this creates uh, a folder that's going to hold this placeholder that tells Mac not to create this uh, this kind of metadata file here, this FS events D. I think it's something for the file system. It stores a bunch of state. Um, so I'm gonna do that. And then this touch command I'm gonna run. This is gonna create just zero size files that prevent your Mac from creating these files. Just run this, I don't need to change anything. Um, and then finally the CD uh, tilde, this command just goes back to the previous directory that I was in, uh, or CD dash rather, sorry. So this just goes back to the previous directory. Um, okay, so like I said, that's the one time you run that and you're done. This board is good to go and it should have all of that metadata junk cleaned up. Um, you won't actually see it because again, all those files are hidden. So you look and explore and it's like nothing changed, but you hopefully have a little bit of space that's free. Uh, now the last thing is when you copy files onto your board, um, you wanna be careful and you want to use the CP command. So you wanna use the terminal and you wanna use this dash X dash uppercase X option because this option tells your Mac not to create all these hidden files and things 
uh, you know, just just raw, just copy this file over and forget any extra metadata for it. So if you downloaded a uh, Python source code from the internet, you want to use this cpx command to copy it over. Now, it's not the end of the world if you don't use the cpx command. It just means that you're going to get this hidden four kilobyte file created, which might be fine if you, if you don't have a large file. Uh, if you're not running into space issues, then don't worry about it. Just drag and drop files and you're fine. Uh, but if you are starting to run into space, space issues, use this cpx command to copy things over. So, you know, let's, uh, let's make a, how about uh, main.py, and let's just call this, we'll just say print hello world. So I'm just going to make a simple little main.py, and then if I want to copy this onto my CircuitPython board, I want to run cp, the copy command, dash uppercase x, has to be uppercase because I think there's actually a lowercase x that does something completely different. Uh, I'm going to point it at the file I want to copy, the main.py right here, and then put it in the direct in the place that I want to copy this to, so that volumes circuit pi location. So this is going to copy it into the root of my circuit python board. So I'm going to do that. That just copied the file over. Um, so I, I just replaced my main.py on the board here. And if I go back to the atom text editor, if I close this main.py, and if I reopen this, hey, there it is. There's my main.py, uh, this hello world file here. So just something to be aware of. If you're copying files on the M0, the Gemma M0, or like the older Feather M0s, the non-express boards that have that 64 kilobyte file system, you probably want to use that CPX command. You probably want to run these uh, one-time commands to turn off the spotlight indexing and all of this stuff so that you don't get all these hidden files that will just eventually cause an out of space error uh, on your drive for these. And again, this is only on Mac. On Windows, they don't seem to do all these hidden files and things. Um, so you just need to be aware of that for this. Um, but at this point, everything should be fine and I'm good to go uh, as far as I'm back at the normal CircuitPython workflow. Like I can open the uh, serial terminal again. So we'll say uh, my USB, oops, oh wait, let me make sure. Oh, wait, this was, I'm still connected to the serial terminal. Wait, let me close out of this. And to close out of the screen command, actually, I forgot to mention this, press Control A and then press K. And then it's going to ask you, do you really want to kill this window? And yes, I want to kill that. And that will exit. That's how you exit the screen command. So, you know, I'll use screen to enter the serial terminal again. So I'm in the serial terminal and then to exit it, control A and then K and then yes to exit. So it's, it's really confusing for some reason uh, to exit the screen command. It took me a while. And this is different if you're on Linux and you're using the screen command. I think there's a good new version of screen and there's like a, I don't know, another version of screen and they have completely different key bindings. So go figure on Mac, this is what you want to do. Anyways, um, we'll, we'll go back. We'll open up the serial terminal. Um, I'm going to press control D to reset the board. So I just reset it. There's my hello world that just ran. Uh, but just to show that this is really working, I'll say hello world. I'm going to press the uh, Apple S key to save that file. And it just saw that it saved and it ran the file again, and I see the output of it down in the terminal right here. So that's, uh, we're good to go. We've got kind of the, the workflow right here of the files on the left-hand side, uh, and then on the right-hand side, your code and your serial terminal here. Um, oh, and I noticed it still shows that Windows 7 driver. Um, I think if you open and close this, yeah, then it reloads this. So it's not smart enough to automatically watch the file system, it looks like. Um, so that's it. That's all that I wanted to show uh, in this video. Again, I wanted to walk through a workflow of how to use CircuitPython on Mac OS. So how to get a workflow of editing files using the Atom text editor, how to access the serial REPL using the screen command that's built into the Apple, uh, the Mac OS operating system, and how to list the serial ports with that LS uh, command. Uh, so you can see that. And then I also just kind of mentioned, you know, here's this little serial terminal uh, plugin that you can use. Again, it's the platform IO uh, serial terminal, uh, or no, platform IO terminal plugin. If, so search for that like I mentioned, and install that. And you've got a nice little terminal that's just built into your uh, your editor like that. Uh, oh, and there's one little last thing I wanted to show. Uh, so, you know, this is a fine and dandy little serial terminal down here. Uh, you know, it's perfectly functional. Uh, but let's see, I'm going to, oops, let me close out of this. Uh, so control AK. But there's a, a fancier terminal editor. So there's one that I really like, and it's only on Mac. It's this program called Cathode and it creates a terminal that looks like an old computer screen. Uh, this is actually commercial, like you, you can buy this. There's a free demo you can use though, so you can download the demo and just play with it. I mean, you don't have to use this, but I just wanted to show this. This is, this is a neat program. Uh, I'm gonna run the demo of this, so let me just 
loaded up real fast uh, on my machine. So when I run cathode, uh, it actually boots up and it looks like some old school computer. Uh, they, they actually put a lot of polish into this. This is cool. You can go, there are lots of different themes. You can have different colors, different styles of monitors. I don't know, let's see what, what is the Teddy Boy monitor. That's a little interesting. That's kind of a unique look. Um, I like this 1991 monitor. This kind of has the look of an old computer screen when I was learning uh, how to program back on like a 486. This is what uh, the, the, the screens look like. And then you can change like some of the colors and stuff. There's like a 286 mode that changes some of the font and stuff. So this is kind of cool. And this is just a normal terminal. This is just like my Mac terminal right here that's behind this, um, but it's just a fun little fancy thing. So I can open up my uh, serial port if I want uh, with this 11.5. There's even sound effects on here. So it's like making little beeps and things. So I can open that up. And here's, you know, my vintage circuit Python. Hello world, uh, vintage we'll say. And this is pretty cool. It's a neat little fun uh, parlor trick maybe or way to impress your friends. Uh, let's see what some of these other themes look like. The K&R theme is like an old C programming style thing. Uh, let's see, how about ooh, a blue theme? That's probably a good one. Oh, wow, I like that That one. That's pretty, I like that one a lot. Um, so fun little program, uh, you know, it's commercial. Uh, it might be worth the cost if you like that kind of thing. Uh, you can use this as a demo. The fun thing is, as an incentive to get you to buy it over time, it will slowly degrade the graphics of the terminal. So it will start glitching out, which is kind of the way these old CRTs would work sometimes. You know, they warm up and after a while they're starting to go bad. So kind of funny that they've just built that in as a feature of this uh, demo. But anyways, this is the cathode program. I'll put a link in the description below. Uh, you don't have to use this, but it's on Mac and it's a fun little terminal program that you can use for this. So cool. So. If folks have questions, throw them into the chat and I'll see if I can get to them. I'll jump to uh, the main view real fast. So we'll go back to the main view. Um, let's see, so, oh yes, yeah, so I was mentioning terminal. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, someone was mentioning about uh, VS Code. So yeah, another editor that you can use, and I showed this in the Windows uh, workflow video, but Visual Studio Code is a really nice cross-platform editor, just like the Atom text editor. You can use it on Mac, you can use it on Linux, you can use it on Windows. Um, very similar functionality. It actually has a terminal built into it, so you don't even need to install a plugin, and I think I showed that in the Windows um, video. So definitely Visual Studio Code, another good option to check out uh, for that. You know, that's, I, it's hard to pick a favorite, like they're all pretty comparable in their capabilities, so you know, it really just comes down to which one you like more, if you like Visual Studio uh, or the Atom text editor. So, you know, you both want to work great uh, for that. So I think that's it then. I don't see any other questions, so I'll wrap up the stream. So thanks a lot for watching. Uh, this was, again, how to use CircuitPython on Mac OS X. And this is a follow-up to videos I've done uh, showing the workflow for CircuitPython on Chrome OS. So I showed how to use a couple Chrome apps that give you the serial terminal and code editing access. And then I also did a video on Windows 10, where I looked at some of the programs you can use on Windows to access the serial terminal and get that kind of editing workflow uh, with CircuitPython. So in this video, I did a follow-up to show on a Mac OS 10. So maybe in a future video, I might show how to do this on Linux. Um, but anyways, if you like this video, check out uh, youtube.com slash Adafruit. You'll see this video and all kinds of other fun project videos there. Also check out twitch.tv slash Adafruit. You can see me stream these things live. I like to stream usually every Friday. I'll do a video stream like this. Um, so I just finished up a bunch of videos on the Circuit Walker sneaker project. So look for a guide in the near future that shows how to build that project. But keep your eyes peeled and I'll do uh, lots more streams in the future. And if you find this content useful, if this is helpful, then click the like or the comment or the subscribe button. Uh, let us know that this is useful stuff and we'll keep making content like this. So until next time, this is Tony from Adafruit. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you later. Bye.